the vault. And if my calculations are correct, this film reel right here should be the legendary X-Men film that should have been released in 2000 had Y2K not destroyed everything. Oh, hey. A vortex! I'm opening the vortex! Ah! Alright, it appears I've entered a world where Y2K never happened. What's this over here? The, look, look at all these X-Men films! I, I can't believe... How many of these did they make? Look at all of these! There's so many of them! Why is there so many X-Men? Hey! X-Men Origins Wolverine! They made an entire film just about Wolverine? That is awesome! This gotta be great! That's right, friends. Just before the new millennium hit us with the paranoia that the entire system would blow up in smoke once that big 2000 appeared, Brian Singer was busy preparing the long-awaited film adaptation of X-Men. It makes sense that this is the first big budgeted attempt at a Marvel property besides Blade in 1998. Something like Spider-Man was too difficult due to the effects. Something like Thor or Captain America was too difficult because of the concept. Nick Fury would be played by David Hasselhoff. X-Men though? Hell, keep your character count low and then you got yourself a movie. One of the biggest shows for kids in the 90s was X-Men the Animated Series. So there was a huge fan base, not just from the comics but from many forms of media, waiting for a project such as this. The co-creator of The Punisher and the one responsible for spoiler Gwen Stacy's death is Jerry Conway, who originally co-wrote an X-Men screenplay in 1984 with Roy Thomas. You know, 1984, the year work began on Howard the Duck, a great year in cinematic history. Orion Pictures had the rights to make the film, but didn't really have the money. Which is weird, didn't they destroy the box office with Terminator? Speaking of Terminator, James Cameron wanted to produce an X-Men film with his wife Catherine Bigelow directing, but then he wanted it to be all computer graphics with 3D, and she wanted it to be a modern war drama, and this led to a fight that led to their divorce. Yep, it's all X-Men's fault. Then Stan Lee was talking too much about Spider-Man, so James Cameron moved on to that project, which also was extinct. Man, Cameron is just good at killing Marvel films back in the day, huh? However, a different kind of filmmaker saw potential. Richard Donner, well, his wife, Lauren Schuler Donner, purchased the rights in 1994. She hired Andrew Kevin Walker to write a screenplay that had multiple rewrites later. He's best known for writing the film Seven. Oh, what's in the box? No, no, don't worry, it's just my screenplay to X-Men, don't open it. Eventually, Josh Sweden had to go at it because he's involved in literally every comic book movie ever made to some degree. Then, finally, Fox made the decision to possibly hire Brett Ratner to direct. Yeah, good thing they didn't do that. We'll never know what a Brett Ratner X-Men film will look like now. I know I'm giving a lot of history right now, but you gotta understand, this film was in development hell for the longest time. It only started getting going when Brian Singer was brought on board, and he even had to give up Alien Resurrection to do this film. Okay, but really, Brian Singer probably could have saved the Alien franchise years ago, so that's a missed opportunity. Sure, we got X-Men, but come on. David Hayter wrote the screenplay with Christopher McQuarrie. He later took his name off the final version because he felt it was more in line with Hayter's version. And Hayter didn't hate. Things had to be cut from the screenplay like Nightcrawler, Beast, and The Danger Room. Apparently $75 million is okay for a film, but $18 million? No way. Cut that crap out and save us $5 million. But X-Men The Last Stand needs to be the most expensive movie at the time at $210 million? <laughs> Good job, Fox. But don't worry, they got the film finished just in time for Christmas of 2000. That was until they moved it up to June of 2000, out of nowhere. Thanks a lot, Fox. You know, that's a good way to risk making a bad product. The movie was a huge success. It made nearly $300 million at the box office, led a huge line of sequels, and jump-started the career of Hugh Jackman. And to think that this was a movie that opens with a literal concentration camp. Yep, big summer blockbuster right here! I know Schindler's List was important, but I don't know if I want a sequel.
The film opens this way because Brian Singer wanted it to be set in reality. So he's the blame, huh? That's why we got a decade of films trying to take comic books so seriously with the dark and edgy gray colors, which is still leaking over into films today like Man of Steel. In any case, it's a great opening scene. I remember in my Captain America 1990 review that it was the only movie I can think of where the opening scene is the villain's origin, but looks like it's done here too. It also works a lot better because the villain is a very sympathetic one. We can see the humanity that's inside him. But we know he's not a human, he's a wizard. You're a wizard. No, no! Oh, you fools. Yep, Gandalf and Captain Picard in a movie together. I get the feeling that Ian McKellen hated being a part of it, though. In the special features, he's straight up giving some shade to Brian Singer. I, I wouldn't put him high in the articulate lists of, of, of being able to describe exactly what he wants. But, you know, those sort of directors are often very boring. The directors who know best. Brian doesn't know best. Patrick Stewart is an ideal choice though, and no, not just because he's bald. He was always the initial choice for Professor X, and helped elevate this movie to a grand standard. If only he could do the same for the emojis. The character I really like though, is Senator Kelly, played by Bruce Davison. Every single thing he does is believable. He acts like a politician, looks like a politician. I like how well he does at this relatively small role. His goal in the film is to make the Mutant Registration Act, much to the dismay of all mutants. It's an interesting case where both the good guys and the bad guys have a common enemy, but both take a different approach. Why didn't Brian Singer hire his frequent collaborator Kevin Spacey? <laughs> They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. <laughs> Thank you. And then we see, and prepare for this, but we see the greatest superhero portrayal of all time. Logan, aka Wolverine. What can I say about this character that hasn't already been said? He's tormented, he has a bad and mysterious past that is covered over the course of these films. He's snarky and a cynic, he has a bad attitude, but comes across as the cool guy in school. He's protective, he's harsh, he's brave, he's everything you want out of a complex hero. He's a loner that, when he finally redeems himself, later becomes a character people can look up to. Even in the bad movies, he's the best part. Oh, well, yeah, we'll get to that someday. It's unbelievable that Hugh Jackman is an unknown at the time, but this led to a career of great films like Prisoners and the underrated Eddie the Eagle, and a freaking Oscar nomination for Les Miserables opposite Russell Crowe, who originally was intended to play Wolverine. This is what happened when he didn't get the part. Eh, nah, nah, I'm too good for that joke. Actually, in the Catherine Bigelow era, Wolverine was gonna be played by Bob Hoskins. Now, that would have been a character. But apparently, Logan is exactly like my dad because he too doesn't play music when driving. Okay, do you know how annoying that is? I'm Rogue. Did you know that the name Marie was created specifically for this movie, the first time Rogue got a real name? Speaking of Rogue, let's talk about her for a second. I can't comment on her character in the comics, but based on what I saw in the animated series, she seemed to be more comedic and fun. In this film, she's a lot more serious, a shy teenager who had a peculiar life. I guess they were combining the characters of Jubilee and Kitty into her as well, but honestly, I think she's a downfall for the movie. Also, technically, those characters still appear in the movie, and one of them later turns into Ellen Page. I think it's a mixture of misdirection, writing, and a poor performance. Anna Paquin won an Academy Award for the piano, so she obviously has some chops, but I just don't think it's evident here. Even during a real serious scene where she nearly dies, she doesn't seem to know what she's doing. Ah! Oh, don't worry. I've managed a lot worse. <laughs> Tis but a scratch. 
A scratch? Actually, you should see her reaction when I play piano music. So excuse me for getting. No, I've never seen the piano. Why? Is it not a horror film about a girl getting attacked by a piano? Apparently there was this angry man who was ticked that the road was blocked when filming this scene. Wish that was in the final cut. We're introduced to Storm and Cyclops, who save the day when Cybertooth appears. The villains for these movies, besides Mystique and Magneto, are uh, quite boring. While it's cool that Ray Park is playing the Toad, he just seems like a lame choice. Not many exciting powers, and while Cybertooth is just plain forgettable. They're what I call low budget villains. Storm and Cyclops are interesting, but they don't really get enough screen time to really develop. We see their powers and learn a little history. Storm supposedly had an accent for this film that was changed for the sequels, but I think that's only really evident in the deleted scenes. For centuries, they persecuted and ostracized the Christians. Then, Almost overnight, their religion rose to become the dominant faith of the Empire. When Logan is rescued, he's brought to Xavier's school, a brilliant set that was actually elevated in order to create natural light. When Logan is first running around the house, it's a really cool scene. We then begin our love triangle between Logan, Cyclops, and Jean Grey. Now, maybe this would work if they actually had separate chemistry with one another, but I hardly see any chemistry between any of them. Jean Grey, like most of the characters, just doesn't get enough screen time. She's supposed to have this arc about trying to overcome her strong powers while dealing with a new love interest in her life, but I don't buy it. Plus, she uses her powers for useless crap. Brian Singer was probably chosen for the directing role because of his experience making The Usual Suspects, having to juggle many characters at one time, something that X-Men would need. But do we really like the usual suspects for the characters or for that twist ending? Because I can't remember any of the characters in that movie. I love that the villain's plan in the movie is to turn the entire United Nations into mutants. It's more interesting than the typical take over the world approach. Don't want to accept us? Then we'll force you to become us! The creators wanted Xavier and Magneto's different ways of dealing with the struggle to emulate that of Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Malcolm X. Uh, if you watch the film Do the Right Thing, at the end credits they show quotes from both of those uh, key leaders during the civil rights movements. Both of them had the same intentions, but both went about it in a different way. Except I don't know if Malcolm X really had a plan to turn all people into black people. See, this analogy would work except the film does paint a more obvious bad guy when compared to the good guys. I know the opening scene and the confrontations are supposed to elaborate their disagreements on approaches, but I think it doesn't work as well when Magneto lives in a really dark and obviously evil cave. If you want their struggle to be painted a lot better, watch X-Men First Class. We'll get to that later. Then we finally get it, what all you fans have been waiting for. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the first Stan Lee cameo. This would continue a tradition that would go on so long that it created a fan theory that he was the Watcher, which eventually was proven true. Except, this isn't his first cameo, Mallrats is. So that's part of the Marvel Universe, right? Here, I'm gonna tweet at Kevin Smith and see if that's what he was going for. It's funny that internet controversy even happened back in the late 90s because at one point Brian Singer was reported as fired on numerous film sites and he actually believed it. Ah, the internet. It's been the same since the beginning of time. It's never changed. How cute. Anyway, this film follows a typical storyline now with the wise mentor being knocked out and the unprepared heroes having to fight the final battle. There's a lot of cool stuff in this scene. Uh, Logan fights Mystique, who has taken on his own likeness. There's a couple of funny scenes. Toad does this really gross thing to Jean's face. And it all leads to a climactic battle at the Statue of Liberty, where just a couple feet away, Fry is being pushed off by Kane. I've always loved how this film ties together at the end. Sure, there's not a lot of character development, but the story's still pretty good. There's enough action, there's enough suspense, there's great effects, and a perfect execution of plot devices. 
Magneto forces Rogue to use her powers of taking other mutant abilities to use his device because it was killing him, but he doesn't care if she dies. And after Wolverine does the biggest destruction to the Statue of Liberty since Ghostbusters 2, Rogue sadly dies and the UN becomes deformed mutants and Magneto defeats the X-Men. A bum ending. I wonder how all the sequels came about. The film had a huge ad campaign. It had lots of trailers and TV spots. All of them featured the same scenes of Mystique transforming and Senator Kelly's uh, mutant form rising out of the water, which, I don't know, I always thought that was kind of a sloppy looking uh, scene. It kind of looks like Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th. Uh, but it also had a website. See, this was uh, 2000, so websites were starting to become a common thing for film, and uh, the web address was x men the movie.com. Isn't that memorable? The film was released on DVD, having a number of deleted scenes that really add nothing to the movie. Segments from the always great Charlie Rose, where he interviewed Brian Singer, a screen test with Hugh Jackman, the typical storyboards and art galleries, which are depressing to look at because they show what the costumes were going to look like, but later changed their minds and went for the simple black leotards. There's trailers and TV spots, and really creepy looking animatics. And a special feature called Mutant Watch, a mock news program that brings back Senator Kelly in a fake Senate hearing discussing the Mutant Registration Act. It's a lot of fun, and it's almost too well acted. I think it was originally aired on Fox to promote the movie, since half of it's a fictional story and the other half is a making of the film. And it's what gave Brad Bird the idea for Elastigirl. Later, the movie was released again to promote the sequel. Uh, it was called X-Men 1.5. This just had a new commentary and it had a complete extra disc that had a two hour documentary that had behind the scenes footage about the making of the film, uh, on set stuff, and even stuff from the premiere, which it's interesting to watch, but I don't think it's a must see. I don't really learn anything new or exciting. That's kind of the common problem with doing documentaries immediately after the film's created. You don't get a lot of those deep details, a lot of the drama that the studio is kind of too scared to reveal that soon after the film was released. Uh, and you also have that weird thing where they keep showing a button that you click and then it brings you to a different video that's not part of the documentary. And I really, I hate when, uh, special features do that, especially when the documentary is already two hours long, you might as well just add it to it, especially when half of the documentary is a handheld recording of on-set footage with this kid who keeps asking Brian Singer questions. What's that? It's a motorcycle. Oh, good. Motorcycle? Yeah. Hey, what's that? Oh, well, that's a train station, and those are big lights filled with helium, so they rise and up in the air. what's that? And that's uh, a light, and an ambulance, and soon... So the one disc DVD has all the special features that appear on uh, X-Men 1.5, and that was basically repackaged later as this two disc Blu-ray here. And uh, this is a really nice set, and uh, I would only recommend it if you're really interested in that two hour documentary. Me, personally, I don't think it'd be that worth it. It's not a documentary I'm gonna watch again, so if you see the one disc version in like some bargain bin, I would just buy that. Uh, if you're buying it on Amazon though, the two disc and the one disc Blu-rays are pretty much the same price, so you might as well buy the two disc. It's up to you though. I mean, the other thing is that the trailers only are on the disc two of the Blu-ray, and I really like having a trailer with my Blu-ray. I don't really get why they don't put trailers on the discs anymore, it's really ticking me off. And the commentary also has a couple interesting things. And I know I've been making fun of this movie for its character development, but this is the one that put Marvel movies on the map. This film gets the important things down. It's got a great story, it's well paced, it's got Wolverine at the center of everything. It has a great dynamic between Professor Xavier and Magneto. Great performances by all the actors, despite not really getting that much screen time. But it led a franchise that would get only better and better. The sequel's amazing, and I'll get to that eventually. And a lot of the other films are 
some of the best superhero movies ever made. This movie is why we have things like Spider-Man and Iron Man and the Avengers and even Batman Begins in the DC Extended Universe. It's all because this film was taking superhero and comic book properties seriously and I still love the movie to this day. The superhero film has come a long way since and maybe people will look back at this with mixed feelings but from this point and looking back it's amazing we ever reached this point. Blade was an okay film but it didn't really do anything that hadn't been done before. It was just a horror action film with vampires. X-Men was a straight up comic book movie. It didn't get nearly as colorful or crazy as they get now, but it was still a risk that led to risks like Spider-Man and Iron Man. We owe a ton to this film, and to the actors, and to the directors and writers. Fox made a move and it paid off. I highly recommend this film. The only real problem is that it's too short, but that's a problem that eventually got fixed with the more superior X-Men 2 in first class leading up to my personal favorite, Days of Future Past. It almost seems like poetry that the man behind the first great superhero film would have a part in this film. We may have a rocky start, but look at us now. Thank you, X-Men, for saving the genre. So if you haven't seen this movie yet for some reason, go see it. It's aged perfectly fine. And uh, get the Blu-ray if you have a Blu-ray collection, either the one disc or two disc. It doesn't really matter. Buy it on digital if you have to. But there is one thing that's only on this specific 2000 DVD. Wait! <laughs> I, I am completely so Spider-Man is joining the X-Men! Oh, oh, Kevin Feige's gonna be pissed! Well, great. Now I'm invisible, just in time for Halloween.